the trees are cleared, animals are taken care of, okay, whatever we wanted to do with them, we have gone ahead. And what should be the next step now? Trees are not there, animals taken care of. What should be the next step? At this precise point, you hear a voice again. You're beginning destruction from the very base, the very foundation of all life. Soil and life within the soil. From here you'll go on destroying life, layer by layer. From simple forms of life to the complex ones. Sparing no one. Reaching your own self. From here begins your slippery slope. We change that landscape, okay? And from that landscape, we make this landscape because we need to exploit the soil now. And when we start exploiting the soil, what does it entail once again? The first was, okay, one layer of trees gone and the layer of all the animals that were on the surface of the land we have to let go of them, okay, bye-bye. Now that it's the turn of the ones that are be below, the, below the ground. So we are eliminating life layer by layer. And this layer 
that is below the ground incidentally is the one that helps assists in growing food so just have a look at them each one of them has a purpose here so the animal life below the ground we don't want let's get done with this you got to kill all of them and eventually from here we have to reach here and there is absolutely no way you can escape this because this is the logical conclusion the logical consequence of the process we started eliminating life gradually and eventually the, the soil has to go dead and then we move on to the next piece of the land to to do the same process so this is inevitable you cannot escape this reality because this is part of the process and therefore we reach a point where the world is left with with the current agricultural practice says we are left with 60 years of topsoil despite all our achievements we owe our existence to a six inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains Okay, plants need water. So what do we do now? Get water from the underground. We are a little back in time yet when things are just starting. Sorry, rivers. Yes, exactly. So we need to enslave the rivers now and bring water forcibly because we have a responsibility to feed large populations so large tracts of land are cultivated and we need to bring water from the rivers and the river is let's say about 100 miles away so who's going to bring the water from there and how canals okay good enough think we we, we are smart people we, we thought about it we can we can dig canals Next problem, who's going to dig canals? No, not, not yet, not yet. We don't have machines, it's about, the timeline is about 4,000 years ago. About 4,000, 4,500 years ago, we started cultivating and at that point, we don't have machines at all. Animals, yeah, animals, but animals cannot dig, you see. Definitely, but yeah, not, not that scale. It's a human job. Slaves, that's the whole point. So we need, we need slaves now for this, this job. What can we do about it? And our next question. Pardon? Get to war. Yeah. <laughs> no choice. Step, you see. What can we do about it? This, this is the process we have stepped into. Okay, we want this. Now we need slaves and we want slaves. 
and then we have to go to war. We have to wage wars now, and we, when we wage war, it's a double benefit. We get the territory, okay, and we get the slaves. Uh, slaves again for two purposes to draft in the war and to dig canals okay we we we, we sift through the better able body okay go there this 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 okay we sift through them so we draft in the war and we put them to use here to grow our food okay in various processes of growing our food and whosoever is left behind in the territory we have attacked okay we tell them to cultivate the land and since now we are growing animals forcibly, we are making them grow. After a year, I can go there and collect tax there. Because I know 20 acres of land, these many bodies of Kanak, okay? So this is my tax, keep it here, whosoever is left behind. So see so many advantages of war and people cry, no war, no war. When the ecosystem is intact, when you do not need to forcibly bring water by breaking the backs of the rivers, in this system, the intact system, water comes from rain. Rain basically falls for trees, not for humans. No matter how much you populate by humans, rain is not going to fall for you. In the ecosystem, rain falls for trees. So when you take down trees, there's going, not going to be the rain, it's going to be scanty, erratic, unpredictable. And your plants, since they are sensitive now, okay, they're not the hardy ones in the forest, they need water at exact times. I have planted today, I'll have to water them. In an intact system, there is a forest floor which holds water, which holds, huge, which holds moisture, and even if it doesn't rain for a long time, the, water, the plants are not going to die. But in this system, I need water at exact times. So I'll have to have those canals through the, the very system of slaves and everything.
the forest cover having been destroyed, with nothing to temperate it, the rain lashes straight on the soil, denuded and bared, and erodes it. With the layer of leaf litter and other organic matter, which acts like a sponge, stripped off from the surface, water does not get any chance to seep in and recharge the aquifers. And with our sprawling human colonies, we of course plaster the earth with asphalt and concrete, not allowing a drop of water to seep in. Rivers shrink. Aquifers dry up. Bread baskets turn into deserts. Interesting, isn't it? Water scarcity, water problem. Now, 70% of the water goes into growing food only for humans. Now, if you really think about it, things are not too complicated. Pretty simple, straightforward. Plants need water, undeniable fact. Water comes from the rains. All the water on earth comes from precipitation, whether it's rivers or aquifers. Now you start depleting your aquifers, you start exhausting your rivers, they can be. Eventually you'll have to depend on rains and undeniable once again. Earth is a water planet. The sun heats things up and water vapour evaporates into the atmosphere from Earth's land and oceans. Circulated by winds, this moisture flows around the world. Rainfall completes the water cycle and shows where the heat ends up. 
Most climate models assume that atmospheric moisture production and transport mainly responds to ocean temperatures and global wind circulation patterns and less in a predictable way to land surfaces. But Earth is also the green planet. Seen from space, rainforests feel daily pulses of moisture into the Earth's atmosphere as they transpire during the day. These pulses of moisture, followed by rain, are clearly visible on this radar animated map of rainfall created by NASA. This water vapour either falls back locally or becomes transported by winds across large distances, bringing rainwater in downwind, often distant locations, even in another country. On this animation, the atmospheric moisture created over the Brazilian Amazon is transported to Argentina and into the Atlantic Ocean. So forests in one country can generate rainfall in another. Getting the global picture and being able to track rainfall from one place to another across the planet teaches us how forests influence the water cycle, how they help replenish our reservoirs. The biotic pump theory provides a novel scientific basis for the huge streams of water vapour in the sky. According to the theory, forests are active low pressure regions. They suck in moisture from the ocean for long distances into the interior of continents and sustain rainfall far within. Reliable rainfall in the interior of continents such as Africa and South America may therefore be dependent on maintaining relatively intact and continuous forest cover all the way from the coast. Somebody is getting excited and saying, oh, you're growing food. Okay. Could you also let us join in? Can we offer you some help?